No, it's 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 been so beautiful to have the opportunity to work and grow alongside a character in parallel for it's I think it's like four years now, including the pilot. Um, I hadn't been that fortunate before. I kept coming to a dead end with the the other TV shows I I was I was on, and we we only got as far as a season. So it's it's been such a blessing to to grow alongside Ray and um, and just have someone's hand to hold while you're navigating adolescence and like young adulthood and young womanhood um and that in and of itself is such a whirlwind so it's it's been nice to have a friend accompany me <laughs> alongside this journey it's nice to hear because obviously she feels like um you know quite a, a kinship to a lot of us in the in the switch fandom as well um and to watch her grow, to watch us grow while she's growing and navigating herself in that capacity too is just, uh, it's sort of like a warm tenderness to the heart for oh, us too. So much more discovery to be had too. Like we, we were block shooting episodes one and two of season three right now and it's already amazing. Like we are all, I mean, I, Amalia and I are having so much fun. So I'll give you that. <laughs> um, we're really enjoying our time together and just talking about the psychology of it all and our relationships and just enjoying the space to to create and play while we have it and just cherishing every moment. You know, like every walk to Crafty that we have, we're just taking in our environment and just really, really trying to remember everything and hold it close to my heart because it's, it's fleeting, you know? You never know how much longer we're gonna have it. Yes, I'm I'm constantly fascinated and, and intimidated by Amalia's brain. <laughs> me as well, trust me. And it works. <laughs> it works for our chemistry. I like it that way. <laughs> it's it's good to hear that you guys are getting to work closer together. Obviously, um, you know, season two kept you apart for quite a while. And of course, COVID kept you apart for quite a while too. Yes. Um, and to hear that you're getting, of course, so to work more closely together and, and no longer separated in, in this duality sense that, you know, your characters are no longer separated, you and Amalia are no longer separated, <laughs> don't ever take her away again type of thing uh, yes. for the whole season. <laughs> I, yes, no, that was a threat. That was a very real threat. <laughs> I want my Amalia. No, yes. it's, it's been really great. I, and I've been getting a lot of FaceTime with, with, where I felt we were lacking last season. So I've, I've been really enjoying that I, I get the, uh, the interactions with these characters and there's a lot of new dynamics blossoming and stuff that you wouldn't really foresee. So um, again, that's as much as I know, just going into episode one and two. Uh, we just got sent our third script today, which I haven't read. So I'm gonna get into that after I hop off with you, but um, I'm going in blindsided here. I like I was saying, I haven't even had my story arc interview yet, so I'm I'm also chatting with the writers right after this. So I'm I'm waiting on pins and needles like you guys. <laughs> I I feel privileged to sort of interrupt everything. Is that uh, it, it turned eleven eleven while you you and I were talking? So yes! it's our 11, I missed <laughs> it. <laughs> Sorry, I have it permanently. So yes, and now we have it permanently. <laughs> yes. Oh, I love that so much. I totally miss that. I was looking forward to it. I'll, I will make a confession that like I was personally looking forward to this because I was like, this is very aptly timed that it will chime 11, 11 for the two of us in between. Okay. I know that's again okay. off topic, but that was perfect for me, you and I. No, it's, it's cool that you are bringing that up or just like so, certain um, symbolic things because I've, I've noticed that every year that we've started filming and I mean, maybe we can have people fact check this, but every year that we started filming, it's been on a new moon. And yeah, when we started this year and it was a new moon, I was just like, okay, something weird's going on here. But it it represents um, new beginnings, like a crescent moon it represents new beginnings and newness and death to make way for growth and um, healing and rehabilitation. So yeah, so it's and so far it's really felt that way. It's it's been a really healing energy on set. Um, we have a lot of new crew. We sort of stole a lot of the crew from Supernatural. So we're all getting acquainted and they're, they're really great. They all work together really well. Um, so it's it's been nice to kind of interrupt their little family and try and wiggle our way in. <laughs> it's, been, it's been really great so far. 
Well, before uh, you started sh shooting season three, I wanted to ask a little bit about kind of what you've been up to during the hi hiatus. We've seen, obviously, like, through your Insta stories and things, you know, like between your coffee uh, <laughs> attempts, uh, your incredible videos from your your family <laughs> and, yes. and campaigns and things like that. <laughs> You've certainly been quite occupied. <laughs> yes, I've been very busy. Fortunately, I have so many great creatives um, in this city between Kelowna and Vancouver and just so many great friends and great connections. And they always they always keep me busy, always find me something to do. So I, yeah, I've been very busy just kind of getting my hands in any creative outlet that I can just to, to keep stimulated. Um, Cause again, aud auditioning has been kind of a lost cause for me because I'm so um, connected to motherland that it's like, there isn't really space for anything else. So while I was waiting to, to get back into sort of my acting pocket, uh, I've been just playing music with myself and um, meditating, yoga. Uh, Lynn Renee introduced me to bar classes, which whooped my <laughs> ass. Those are great, but That's I feel, some serious stuff. I feel yeah. like a strong soldier. So that went me back into shape. And I, I've just been, uh, I, have a, I have a business that I'm trying to start and we're kind of getting into, I'll give you a hint. We're getting into selecting scents right now. So uh, that's been really, really fun for me. I have like a massive scent collection. Of, if you guys want to know what I smell like today, it's a pine tree. It's called Le Long Fong. Fong? I don't know. Number two, Maison Louis Marie. Um, so I'm, I'm very into scents. And so I've been sort of playing around with that and uh, with our developer. And um, uh, yeah, I've been, my, my dad and I, we set up a studio in a house that we bought. We also bought a house this year. So um, my parents and I bought a house together. Um, they're happier. We're in a much safer neighborhood now. Um, okay. So yes, yeah, so it's it takes a lot of stress off my heart when I'm out out in Vancouver. Um, but yeah, so they're they're safe, and my parents just seem to be aging backwards. Um, they're happy. Bless they them. Have, like garden space, and they have a view, and it's it's everything they've worked so hard to have, and I'm I'm so happy that that they have that, it warms my heart. They're just, they're really happy. So I just, yeah, I've just been enjoying that. A lot of family time. It's um, important too, cause that's so nourishing. Like you talk about all the, you know, working with your family so closely. It's so, so nourishing that you can have that kind of relationship and um, in a creative space and in a personal space at the same time and, and have that fluctuate. Yeah, I mean, and it's like, it, it's become so integrated in my family, sort of my, my uh, creative endeavors. Um, like my sister and my best friend Pam are out here and they're also working on the set of Motherland and, you know, they're trying to get a feel for, um, I guess, more behind the camera, but um, it finally piqued their interest. I've been trying to drag everyone out here because I get lonely out here. So I've been trying to get excuses for everyone out here. And um, yeah, I finally won them over and they, they, they both worked together before, um, before this job. So they work well as a team and now they're working on the set. So it's, I'm just surrounded by what feels like a lot of friends and family because that's what we've grown. We've worked really hard to grow the last few years and um, it, it feels nice. It feels like coming home and it feels like it's, it feels natural and it feels like where I'm meant to be. And it, it's really hard to envision myself anywhere else right now. So I, I keep, just, again, I keep trying to be present and take in every bit of it, but it's, um, it's fleeting. Life is fleeting. So it's a good it's a good lesson to learn. Yeah, every, every moment is, is slowly slipping away, but to to have that comfort so present and have your family be a part of all of these wonderful accomplishments that, and you get to be creative with them and and, and really nourish their endeavors at the same time that yeah. you're getting to live yours at the, you know, what, what greater beauty could you ask for in life, right? It's such a blessing. I'm just, I don't know how I got so lucky. I, I don't deserve it. Oh my God, your puppy. What's your puppy's he's, name? He's going to jump in and out of here. His, he's a, his name is Brule. Brule? He's a dachshund. Hi, Brule. You want, me to tell Ollie, you want me to tell Ollie hello? <laughs> I will tell Ollie hello. Uh, Ollie's back in, in uh, Kelowna now, so I'm missing her a lot. I will pass on the message. And a happy belated birthday to her too. Aww, <laughs> <thank you. laughs> 
<laughs> she was so happy. We got her a bunch of like cookies and cupcakes and they were gone in like five seconds. Yeah, it was great. Well, switching um, back to motherland um, and, and this journey that we've talked a little bit about for Rael, um, what do you really kind of feel were some of the key or greatest developments that we did get to see from, from Rael from season two? Um, I think really being stung again and, and having to relive that heartbreak and knowing that she wanted to approach it differently this time because of the way it destroyed her um, formerly. So um, I think she wanted to find strength in it. And because she had sort of discovered new purpose, um, I think that's kind of what motivated her want for growth and, and her want to go on not for herself, or sorry, not for other people, but for herself. And, and understanding that, you know, the only person she can really rely on and trust is, is yourself. And I know that sounds a bit cynical and she has people around her um, th that, that are support beams for her and, and create a great foundation. But it was, it was more like the really trusting yourself and rediscovering what it feels to, to be in love with your own self and spend time with your own self. And I think those are important lessons to learn. And um, to do so in a healthy and loving way, not because you're rejecting any affection or affirmation that's presented to you, but because you find community in yourself. Um, so she she grew into it in a healthy way and, and learned how to be by herself in a way that that was beneficial and, um, and helped her grow and pushed her rather than when we first meet her. And she's sort of estranged because it's a choice, not because it was what it was a healthy place for her to be in. Um, so it was, it was really interesting at that time too, because I was also sort of navigating these pockets of being alone versus being lonely and, and what that feels like, what it means to me and just, um, really understanding what it means to enjoy your own company. Cause that's, it's a hard thing to do. And it takes, it's a conscious lesson. It's not something that you have an epiphany and then you have it and it's a tool in your belt. It's something that you have and then you unlearn and then you relearn. And um, it's a process with the self that continues as a lifelong journey. So uh, it was nice to see th these pockets of humanity in her and um, really ride the discovery and the, the wave of mourning and grief and then self-discovery. She does it in such an earnest way too, uh, an earnest and, and believable, honest way. Because it's and, messy. Yeah, <laughs> and that's I what mean, we're like. Right, right. I mean, grief, it, it takes forms in, in so many different shapes and, and the way that we process it is also in, in different forms and different shapes. So it's messy, like you're saying. It's, it's unbelievably messy and, it's, and it hurts and it's painful. And, and, and then, you, you know, you, you find your way out of it somehow, some way, sometime, you know, in your own path. Yeah, but what's more human than messy pain, which is such an ironic thing for for a witch, you know. Yeah. But I was I was also trying to cope with, I mean, death, which is so so taboo, and it's something that I I realize we don't really talk about. And I went through something really interesting where I, I lost two friends and my grandparents in the last three hundred sixty five days, and so I I really. I've really become familiar with with grief. We're we're good good pals now. But um like the every time that it happened it, it felt different and I coped with it in a different way. But in a workspace because of covid going on, I think it felt so heavy. And we did find these moments of lightness that we were really um really grateful for, but we were starved of affection and communication and and you know physical touch and and just just true present connection. So it was just, it, it carried into, into my grief. And I, I felt that I was withdrawing further, which is not like me. I, I'm very much to wear my heart on my sleeve. I mean, hence my little, my newest addition. <laughs> but uh, I'm very much to, to narrate my feelings openly i like i'm not shy to do so and i'm kind of known for being theatrical because of, because of it but we've seen the tweets I, <laughs> yes <laughs> i expose myself taylor media is not a diary do not treat it as so um 
but yeah, so I, I felt that I really, I really withdrew this time. I kept questioning whether it was, it was healthy or not. And I actually really looked to Rael for advice for this, which was strange at the, in, in the connection and, and, you know, feeling resentment and anger for myself and then for why these people passed, you know, because some of it was unforeseen, like a, a couple of my friends were very young. And so feeling angry about their patterns and things we had talked about and then feeling resent for myself, like, did I, did I do enough? Was I there enough? Could I have prevented this? And the guilt that goes along with death. And I mean, obviously in a, a clear state of mind, we know that we can't blame ourselves or be responsible for other people's feelings or actions. But when you're in pain, it's really easy to jump, jump to that conclusion and just take the fault on because humans are funny. Sometimes we really like to be sad. We like to be sufferers and martyrs to our own situations. And um, because of COVID going on and everything felt so heavy and no one could go home to visit their families for Christmas and everyone was hurting in their own way. I decided not to share with anyone because I think I personally personally needed the safety net to segregate my um, to segregate my personal life from my work life. And I think I think if I had I crossed that boundary, it, it would have been a lot more difficult for me. I feel like my emotions would have become very unpredictable at work so i saved my grieving for times when i was alone and where i where i felt safe um and normally i i wouldn't feel that way i i like to be held and and comforted but i was i was embarrassed almost by by showing my feelings at that point and it was something that where I, it was a new discovery for me of of this roller coaster of emotions um but i felt that i really related to rail here and how she felt embarrassed to to show anything other than stoicism for a while and and i was like wow i really i understand her further from from season one so it was a really interesting point of connection between me and her where i i, I empathize with what she was going through because before that it was a little bit difficult for me to understand uh, i was like well why can't you just talk about your feelings you know why doesn't everyone just talk about their feelings and it's like it's just it's more fucking intricate than that that's people are more intricate than that and I, I honestly think I made the right decision like I, I had my safe space where I, I told the people that I needed to but you know and I found out some other cast members had lost people too so I, I wasn't alone in feeling that but we chose lonely journeys but I, I, I think it was what we needed at the time and I think um, yeah that separation between work life and work being a safe space where I can come there and forget about what I was doing and just sort of create and, and get lost in the, the process and the art. Um, because once you get your feelings involved, it's a little bit difficult, you know, and you take your work home with you and vice versa. And it's really easy to mix up those lines. That's why I can't work from home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, grief has been a very interesting journey the last year. Well, we, we talk about um, grief and loss, and, and certainly um, there was two portions of, of grief and loss that Rael experienced over this, this season, um, the loss and, and feeling the grief over a relationship that she had kind of ended and thought that Scylla had gone away. And, um, and then, of course, this second wound reopening of, of losing her mom, Willa. Yes. Um, first, she obviously thought she had lost her for years, you know, and stuff like that. And then to find out that she had still been alive and and then to lose her all again in this you know humongous tragically sac tragic sacrifice um and i wanted to find out kind of like when did you kind of know about the overall arc involving at least these two forms of, of grief and um and really kind of how grief ends up being like a connection and sort of a catalyst simultaneously in the season two yeah, it was definitely a vehicle for storytelling and, uh, and just a lot of other feelings as well. Um, I mean, initially, again, we have we had our story arc meeting probably about usually it's usually a month before we start shooting, not in the midst of. So it's, I'm very surprised by the element of storytelling this time around, um, which I like. I love surprises. Um, so beforehand, I was kind of given 
the understanding that Willem might still be alive. And they kind of dropped hints here and there. And uh, for, for me, and then obviously, like when, when we find out in the scripts that she actually is still alive uh, and the audience finds out. But my question was, when, are, when is Rael going to find out? And I wasn't sure if she ever was going to. And of course, it's there's that happy in between where it's like she finds out, but it's just, they just miss each other. And they have this point between life and death, which is so surreal and so befitting of their their relationship, even post Willa's death, um, when Rail was grieving. You know, it's a, such a fitting space for them to finally have unity. Um, so I found out a little bit before, but I did not know that Willa was going to give her life for Rails uh, until much later into shooting. And I, I remember out loud gasping when I was reading the scripts and just slamming it on the ground and going, no, you joking, Elliot, what the fuck? Because <laughs> um, of course, but I was like, oh my God, I can't, because I feel everything so, so deeply that I was like, I was sort of excited to, for it to be released so that I could, I like sharing feelings. I like sharing grief, which is like what I was saying is a bit strange that I decided to withhold at that point. But um, I was excited to share the journey with people and and see what they, they had to say and see if they related or or it made them feel something, you know, because that's, that's the point of it all, isn't it? It's to feel something. So, um, yeah, it was it was a wild ride. And I remember shooting those scenes. I, I had just found out about the, the passing of um, my my grandfather, um, whom we were really close with, both my grandparents, uh, and they're both they're both passed now uh, on my dad's side. But um, yeah, wow. <laughs> so uh, we we kind of split up. Obviously, the the shooting was in in two separate increments. So it was sort of in person when Hearst had me on the table and was doing his fun little science experiments. We'll just call them that. <laughs> and um, and Willa and Stella show up and Willa comes to my rescue. But um, when we shot in that sort of liminal space in inside that sort of dreamscape of the mycelium, um, that was on a separate day. And we shot all of those scenes uh, back to back in correlation with each other. And it was a very quiet, heavy day. There wasn't many people in the studio because it was all green screen around us. And it was just us bearing to each other. And there was so much that wasn't said. And we both knew that the pain was coming from somewhere honest. And I think the, the pretty thing about it was that we didn't ask. We just enjoyed that we were sharing and listening with each other and and using the tool of acting as a vehicle to to convey how we were feeling because I think everyone was holding their breath and no one was talking about it. Everyone was just holding this sadness and guilt and and loneliness for so long for this like the the entire pandemic and um it it just kind of came out and it was like really a breath of fresh air and I remember when we wrapped we just held each other for a long time and again it was just it was something nice about just not asking and just enjoying that we felt safety in each other to give those pieces of each other and and share them and and we just listened and it was yeah it was really beautiful I, I really cherished that day and I love Diana so much she's such an amazing scene partner and she was really a safety net and uh, and just a saving grace in general for me last year. She she really um really felt like she was holding me up the whole time. <laughs> yeah. I had the lovely chance to to chat with her for an interview. And um, of course, obviously she said like the nicest things imaginable, of course, for you. And just that you really kind of gave every fiber of your being to every one of those emotional moments between the two of you. And it's, it feels poetic. It's like, it feels like, again, we talked about parallels and duality. It just feels poetic to have, have these moments together um, in, in a Shakespearean capacity. <laughs> in <a sense. laughs> it feels that way. And like I said, like call us theatrical, but it was, 
you get these rare moments. And if you've ever read the book, Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert, this is the only thing I can kind of relate it to of just like these pivotal moments while you're creating that you're like, this is it, this is the point. And they're so rare, but I, I had one of those and I hadn't, hadn't had one in quite a few years, actually since shooting um, Incident in the Ghost Land. Uh, and just being like in this state of such raw emotion that when the camera cut, you couldn't really tell because you know your body doesn't understand what you're going through your body's like this is traumatic this is real what's happening to me is very real your brain can make the distinction but your body has no idea so you do take that home that work home with you sometimes um and you feel it like it's very exhausting like when you're having these racking cries all day and you're really just you're letting her rip you know so um but yeah there was just a, a few times where we cut and we just both couldn't stop crying and then they they left us in silence to just be, and um, you know, when we could kind of catch our breath, we'd, we'd reset, but like everyone was really, really patient. I think everyone was really, really feeling it that day. And um, yeah, everyone, everyone was just kind of like sitting in their own solace and their own thought. And I feel like everyone was sort of thinking about their family that day and everyone, it was a really quiet, strange day in the studio. It was like, it's not it's not normal but um yeah it was just one of those things where like I, I couldn't stop crying but I was like I needed I needed it I needed it so badly to just I, and I was really worried about it because I knew how much I was holding internally that I wasn't sure how the reaction was going to come out or because I had suppressed it so much if it even could um because as an as an actor you want to keep your emotions at the ready right so it's it's that's why we're generally so emotional and theatrical is because we, we keep them right here to, to give. And the more you suppress, the, the more difficult it is to be honest in your craft. And so I felt that I was really struggling up until that point, just battling my own mental hardships. And yeah, it was, we really used it as a vehicle of, of therapy and healing. And um, the, the closest thing I can relate it to in its strangest sense is big magic. We'll have to check it out. I, I personally haven't read it, but uh, it's a good it's a good start to uh, as a creative, one creative to another. Yeah. Well, um, we talk about expressions of grief or or sometimes non expressions of grief um, and holding things in, and, and we sort of get two kind of expressions from Ram. Um, obviously, she has gotten um, in touch with mycelium through. The death cap song, or as I call it, death cap, death cap for cutie. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's a new one for me. I like it. <laughs> that's what I deemed it this season, and I was like, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> <laughs> you got death cap for cutie um, with the mycelium being connected to Rail through her grief. Um, with Scylla and, and that relationship that wanted that seed. And then we get this um, beautiful stirring song that you sing, the book of love, um, while your L'Oreal is in the session with, and, um, amongst um, Tally and her father and, and these memories, uh, you know, and pictures and things like that in her room. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to sort of ask about, uh, far be it from me to, to say what anyone is thinking, or, you know, and their intentions, but it really felt, um, I know that Elliot had mentioned, um, he felt like it was a song sort of um, Rael had felt towards Scylla in that moment. But to me, it also, um, and then again, dualities in a sense, it really also felt like um, a song in that moment to to sing about her mom, Willa, and the, and the longing that's there as well. Um, yes. And I wanted to... <laughs> I wanted to sort of ask about this like great poignant moment that um, we really kind of see Rael processing her grief in, in this way a, a little bit at least or at least acknowledging her grief in that regard and, and was there any kind of direction or, or any note in your either in the script or in your own mind um, you know who this song or what it meant for you for your character there was nothing in the script but we love to read between the lines <laughs> as actors and the directors as well. Um, and even the writers, you know, there was a conversation we all kind of had. Um, 
I think a, a lot of people were excited, uh, like on the production team, about the notion that, you know, we're we're singing the silla, but that's so funny that you caught that because to me it was just about the notion of longing in general and and what love looks like in all forms and what love looks like when it's honest and how far are you willing to bend if the love is honest you know what i mean what will you forgive um and yeah the book of love is is really funny because it talks about sort of like how contrived but also how um abstract and messy it is and and i think that applies to both Scylla and willa very much so um I don't know if I've talked about this before, but when I was performing it, I don't know what happened, but I, especially in the room, I really felt like I was singing to my grandma at that point. Cause I, the guitar I used was my guitar and I had a little picture of my grandma tucked in the, in the top. And I remember they took it out. Obviously we had to depersonalize the, <laughs> the uh, guitar, but um, yeah, they, they really let me, use my own guitar and uh it was it's one that had been in my family um and my grandma i have this video of her singing when she was she got very sick before she passed um she was still singing like these old folk songs and for some reason that was like what kept replaying in my brain today and i or that day and i, I felt she she was really sort of proud of me in that that moment that i like i <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I miss her a lot. So it was something that um that's so funny that you caught that because yeah, I really it was just like the emotion of longing. My my grandma was really that pillar for us and our family. And um it's felt really, really empty since we lost her. And um the heartbreak is what actually killed my grandpa. He just completely deteriorated after losing her. And she was just such a firecracker and like I've I've pulled so much of that raggedness that Braille carries from her and and like in my own self and just that like wild stop for nothing bulldoze forward and so I just I really felt like she was watching me that day and I just like I I, I hadn't felt present her in a while I like I used to just talk to her like nonsense all day and just tell her things but like yeah I hadn't I hadn't done it in a while and for some reason that was just like it just kept intruding in my brain. It was like this thought. I just remember her, her singing when um, she was really sick and she was still managing to sing and she sounded beautiful. So yeah, I miss her so much. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I, um, I know the grief of losing grandparents on both sides. I know the grief of losing other family members. And I lost a family member um, while I was watching Motherland um, unexpectedly. I lost a, a cousin of mine. And so there's a, I, 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 know, I know the feelings of, of wanting someone and, and also feeling them there at the same time, um, not to go off on things, but I have a cousin who, um, he he's like uh, a psych he's not like a psychic but he, he he talks to you know he can has that connection with the the dead and he yeah. always tells us like you know um if you look for a butterfly or you look for like a flock of something or you know like you look for signs that they're they come on your birth and you know, people show up on your birthday and, and he says there, there definitely are signs um there so when when you think of your grandmother and she's thinking of you that, that means that she's thinking of you yeah, I actually, I really, and I really needed it that day too. Like I, I really needed her. And so I really, yeah, I felt her that day, but it, to me, yeah, it was just so much about just the, the, the idea of longing in general in whatever form that, that love was, it was just longing, needing, missing someone and feeling really vulnerable and childlike. Yeah. Thank and of you course, beautiful thank you so You're much. very welcome i know that a lot of people would love to to hear a longer release of of the song and have been like begging and pleading and and maybe even a petition down somewhere along the road it exists somewhere <laughs> but, 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 
I think they need to release like a full Motherland soundtrack and then include that. Yes, I concur. They actually, they have some great stuff. Whatever they use from one of the trailers, which was like a really dark rendition of witchcraft. I'm obsessed with it. I, I think I finally found it and I added it to my, I make playlists on my Apple Music. I'm still on Apple Music. Um, and there's one I made called Black Magic Woman, which is like completely motherland and it's kind of what i play in my ears um every fall and when i'm shooting um i think book of love is in there as well <laughs> but like yeah the the rendition they did of witchcraft it's escaping me who did it but it's so eerie and like thunderous and it just sounds like it's made for cinema but they did a or used a really short clip of it in one of the trailers and oh my god i'm obsessed with it so if they release a soundtrack put it on there because i love it it's the best. Well, we we talk about um, love, of course, and um, and the and the great love of of Rayla together um, that we've gotten to to see their journey as well. Um, you know, before season two started, Elliot um, in in certain interviews and interviews that I talked to him about <laughs> that he referred to them as like celestial beings. And um, Diana has referred to them when I talked to her um, as, as, as love being a North Star. And I wanted to sort of ask a little bit about, you know, with their, you know, necro, life, death, um, rebirth and things like that, kind of what you see their trajectory and, and how you would really kind of describe them together. Whether it's you know certainly of course at the towards the end of season two or during season two and and now you obviously haven't had your story meeting for season three but yeah it's it's pretty funny to see two anti heroes fall in love like two people that genuinely believe they're the bad guy find goodness in each other and promote that in each other um, it's it's so funny because we've had this whole like star crossed forbidden thing as, as thus far and. Now we're really getting the chance to just play around with a potential of normalcy and like what a, a normal relationship looks like between them when there isn't like imminent imminent threats and just the threat of you know pushing forward and maybe not being present with each other and it's just like very normal normal things so it's i'm excited to play around with them how relatable we can we can be, I guess, in just in terms of like normal relationship struggles in, in any sense of the word, whether that be platonic or romantic. But um, I'm excited to get my character arc so we can delve into the psychology of it. But yeah, to me, I mean, celestial beings nails it. And I just think, like, I think of them like the death card in the tarot, which sounds so ominous, but it doesn't... one of my favorites, it's one of my favorites, because without death, there is no newness. And I love change i love stimulation i i need it i need it to to function i just need constant stimulus all the time and um to me that's what they really represent it's just like creation and growth and movement um and uh they complement each other so well they're like yin and yang like the, especially with her connection to the mycelium it's directly connected to to being necro and i think that their powers complement each other so well and it's so funny that I, I truly do see them as yin and yang. Um, that, you know, Scylla is basically, she works with the composition of the energy of death. And Rael works with the composition of healing. And so in some aspects, they completely defy each other. You know, like when, when someone is trying to succumb to death and Rael is doing the opposite, is trying to keep things alive. So you see that uh you see that dissonance in them sometimes of just in miscommunication you know what i mean of of both wanting the the common goal but having a different trajectory to get there and and then you see them sometimes work so beautifully in parallel in the way that they complement each other in in the cycle of death to life and newness and healing and and so on and so forth and so to me, it represents one of my favorite momentums of life. It's just like the death of a chapter or the death of an emotional phase or the death of an aesthetic even. Like it just, it, to make room for something new. And 
I think always having the potential for newness is creates undying love because it just, you know, love is a choice. You wake up every day and you make a choice to love somebody. And that's what a union is. You know, love is hard conscious work. And I think I have a feeling that that's going to be their biggest conflict between each other this um, this season is just making the choice to wake up and choose each other constantly and you know not having anything come between them except themselves which is going to be a very different dynamic and i think it'll be something that's really fun just to play with the psychology of all of it but um yeah they're they're yin and yang life and death to me it's very interesting I know a lot of people are like, we want some comfort moments, like have them making waffles or like get let them chill for a little bit, like read to each other. And then, yeah. and then, and like, yeah, of course. I mean, like, I certainly would love to see that too, but like, I want to see the dynamics and the fire that, that each one brings and, and the small close quarters that they have yeah, to share absolutely. for once. <laughs> I think that's where we're going to see like the normalcy is just like the same intense emotions but just doing very mundane things which is going to be such an interesting contradictory thing to watch <laughs> unfold so yeah i think we're gonna have a lot of fun playing with it molly and i are very excited and we uh we've been having little meetings about about it it's been really fun Yes, that's the other thing. They're like, where other fans are like, where are these pictures? Like, we want to see a picture of them together. Like, give me the pictures. I'm like, they okay, probably can't do this. <laughs> we want to so bad, but we can't post anything because it's a giveaway of right. what's happening. And I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say anything else except that we all look very different. So we can't take that element of surprise away from the network. And so as much as we want to post about anything or take a picture together, um, we're up at like the crack of dawn and we go to bed like long after the sun goes down. So like the only appropriate time would be like when we're completely disfigured people like just not mentally here it's before like at the crack of dawn before 15 hours of work or post that's kind of all we have right now so but we are trying to have uh like a girls night or some kind of something where we all kind of get together um i think yeah one of us will host it and we're gonna have either like a friend giving i don't know how, much, how many of us are going to be there but uh we're trying to get everyone to go we're also trying to go on like a a dune date we all want to go see this movie because like, a few of us have seen it and the ones that haven't feel really left out because apparently it's like the greatest movie of all time <laughs> i'm one of the left out so i have fomos and the, these people want to the those who have seen it want to take us all in a group date to go see this movie because apparently it's vital so maybe then we could send some uh reuniting photos but we are we are for any comfort that it gives we are enjoying each other's company and we're hugging again and holding each other and spending time with each other and we're able to go out and do things um ashley and i like strangely met up on halloween by accident we both i was like co-hosting this uh we were having a really little get together with like just kind of the actors and some of the creatives in town and so we we had to kind of like vax past check everyone that was going to come and then uh, one of our friends was like, can I bring someone? Uh, he was a friend of my friend Noah, who was, uh, like, it was his studio. And uh, he go, he's like, yeah, one of, one, of, one of my friends wants to come. And then his name was Cameras and Cameras <laughs> brought Ashley because we were like, well, we have to like vax check everyone here. And he was like, no, 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 like, don't worry. She's got her, she's got her double vaccinations. And it was Ashley. And I was like, of course you would show up to the only place, that, yeah. It was really funny, but uh, it was great. We had like a really, really small little community of people that are all pretty comfortable with each other. Um, um, yeah, so we had a really small get together, which was so refreshing to to be able to be in a room of creatives again without having the pandemic just like weighing over. Yeah, it was really nice. But we incidentally ran into each other somehow, of course. I just love that, obviously, because like you said, you're not able to share anything that I just love to watch um, all of Twitter just kind of theorizing be like, what is the hair going to look like? But I'm sad that Rahel's hair is not going to have this anymore. And I'm sad that we won't get to see this outfit. And, and like, 
I'm like, oh, okay, at least I enjoy like the theorizing portion. Like we have zero crumbs, zero crumbs. And they're like, your hair is going to look like this. <laughs> We're gonna I'm, have this. I'm enjoying this too. I'm watching all the theorizing because I'm like, I know. <laughs> so, but um, hair is still short, still short, still had to hack it off. So it's not too crazy. It's a little crazy. It looks different, but I won't say how different. I'm, not, um, I'm like the I'm me and Ashley are terrible. We always like give away way too much. So I'm like, I'm gonna stop. Well, I can, well, I can save myself. I'm gonna give you a life bow, Taylor. <laughs> Please do. Um, we talk about these, of course, the dynamics um between Scylla and Rail and and what we would uh like to see them now that they're in closer quarters, but um when obviously they were in, in Nicta's cabin um uh, and, and Nicta's magic was at work. Uh, Rael calls Scylla a murderer in that moment uh, of being under the spell, and uh, the worst thing that really Scylla can say to Rael is that she's Alder's puppet. And I wanted to ask a little bit of kind of like, what does this say sort of subconsciously then, uh, and in this moment specifically then, like, um, the hidden way that they maybe view each other in a sense or harbor certain things um, towards one another, and, and I'm glad that they were able to work through those, those moments uh, as well. Yeah, I see them either both as Scorpio or like Scorpio Aries. And when you burn one of those people, it's kind of hard to undo that. So it always kind of, there's like a residual. And I think it's just, a, it feels like a safety net or just like overly intuitive or maybe even a little cynical, you know, that you kind of harbor this idea that this person isn't quite trustworthy yet. You know, they cross that line and it's really hard to come back out of. And I think that's part of their love is waking up and choosing each other every day, regardless of what had happened or what the motivation was. Um, but I mean, at this point, they hadn't really rekindled that. And so I think there, yeah, there's a little bit of resentment being harbored. I think Scylla was probably feeling a little silly, like feeling she was like, throwing or everyone they do whether it's like to feed your family or to protect your emotions or protect somebody else like you had to hurt somebody to protect somebody else there's always some kind of justification oftentimes humans don't do things just for the sake of being terrible you know and and if they if they do it's just because they resent themselves and they you know there's a, the whole psychology about it no one just like it's just like topic just likes to be terrible for the fun of being terrible there's always something a little deeper. So I think that's where we, it, it's hard to make a villain likable. And I feel Alder and, and Scylla were really villainized and they they made really strong character choices that made them the most beloved. You know, some of the most beloved characters in the show, which is mind blowing and you can only credit to their talent. But um, I think that shows to, you know, Rael and she's kind of, even, as much as she wants to distrust and dislike these people, they give her purpose and they give, they make her feel strong. And it's, it's, you know, I think she feels, she starts to become a little protective of Alder because that's, she's now the biggest bioweapon that the army has. I mean, that's, a, that's a serious place of importance and responsibility. And she, she now feels like she's of use to her community. She doesn't feel like a waste of space, which I, I feel, felt like that was something she was battling for so long. So she has purpose. So, you know, now <laughs> when that's, she's feeling threatened about that and feeling protective about that, you know, of, of course, Scylla comes from a place of completely hating the construct of the army. She was raised to basically dismantle the, the idea of, of having to be um, conscripted to the army. So, <laughs> so cute um and yeah so i mean i i, I the, the most brutal part about it is i think there was honesty to it you know they were really right. intending to hurt each other where they knew it would hurt where they knew it would make them defensive and, um even though it was a spell i think it was like everyone was kind of saying what they thought deep down but funny enough i think in the end just having all of that truth out there really created a and in, a more intense bonding experience. Like there was nothing held back. Everyone kind of knew it was on the table. 
from there you can only forgive or understand or empathize accept pick your adjective but like yeah i think they they only used it as a tool of learning and growth furthermore and of course like when friends and and family and lovers fight and you feel like you've gotten over something like it really bonds you that much more just like the whole the theatrics of like putting yourself through drama just like you're like oh well we made it together even though 10 minutes ago we were against each other but like we got we got to that closing point of of connection so i think it it, it turned out well for them in the long run is that kind of part of um, sort of in a hand, like when Rael um, and Scylla are together, like in the twilight, you know, moment that they share, like why you think a little bit of, of Rael like kind of stops, turns around and then runs right back to Scylla. Is that part of that, that grip, so, uh, that yeah, draw, so much, that magnetism? Yes, the, the forgiveness of, of everything that had happened. It just, it didn't, it paled in comparison to what she felt. And she's like, maybe I'm doing the dumbest fucking thing I could do right now, but I just know how I feel. And she's done anything but trust that for so long. And when she did, it fucked her up. So she she really made a strong decision to, to just trust her intuition and trust how she felt. And I think sometimes we try to use logic to trump our feelings and um, it never wins <laughs> ever. Um, and you know, if it does, oftentimes we're miserable and we always go, what if? And I think she just decided that she'd rather know than ask what if for the rest of her life. So she ran back. Thank God. <laughs> right. It's such a it's such a, a tender moment though, too, because Scylla has really let a lot of herself out, put that out there on the line and be vulnerable and giving of herself and something like an attachment that she says that she doesn't do and mm -hmm. in a way to you know sort of redeem or you know make an offering in a way to rail um to to show her affection and tenderness and um and then to have that like i said that magnetic pull of rail to come back and like just like snap in that acknowledgement and and even something small as like a short kiss like that it, it just had such a broader sense to, between the two of them that uh ignited a flame or ignited the magic moment uh, between the two of them and and rekindled it as well do you ever have that like person that's kind of a little toxic but you just can't keep away from and even then like even if you manage to get enough space or even years in between you, you just still think about that person you're like, what if it was wrong place, wrong time? It's just like, they're, the, they're these people that just can't stay away from each other. And I get that feeling. It's like, you just, your lives are so integrated and you've grown so much together. And it's just like, there's sometimes, I think there's other things working that we don't know are happening. And fate has a, has a funny way of making things happen. So you just got to trust the process and trust that you're put in the right space at the right time. Because... We invented time so what even is time you know what i mean trust that you're where you're meant to be there's no wrong place wrong time trust it i i love all morally great characters give me the fluctuating compass the broody sassy smoldering sexiness the way that they just do what they do and like the the badness of it all that that toxicity just like mm that that level because of attraction it's what we love it's what we love it's exciting like no one wants stability Ugh. i wish i did i wish i loved stability that'd be so great my taurus moon would be thriving if i love stability but i don't i want i want some i want a project i always want something that i can fix and i feel like they kind of find that in each other where it's like you know i can i can fix the brokenness in you and it's it's that idea of understanding the boundary and and kind of understanding that again you're not responsible for other people's feelings and actions and all you can do is be the best version of yourself and and hope that that person grows in parallel to you it's all fake it makes me feel really good also in, in a sense for amalia as well because she thought in like season one or before season one that like so many people would just like really hate Scylla so much and then like to see 
this redemption arc and see these offerings, see the the growth from her character and that compass continue to just swirl and swirl and swirl and and have this rewarding part to Amalia's character Scylla and, and getting in to portray that and, and have such devotion, have so many fans feel like this is this character has become their favorite. And for me, she's always been my favorite. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. She's my favorite too. Her and all of her. <laughs> but just, just to have this great rewarding um significance at least to me for for amalia on her behalf it just makes my heart just feel full feel very full for her i know i was i was worried uh during season one just how harsh people were being and and like again it was a very new fandom and thankfully we have such a great tight-knit community now where we all keep each other in check we all are respectful of boundaries and if there's someone that necessarily isn't you know everyone's kind of like hey respectfully we're all we're all just people at the end of the day like don't don't come here unless you're going to show kindness or like you know you, you can get excited or enthused or like angry but like to be hateful or spiteful and and also misunderstand an actor from their character is where, where i feel like people cross the line a lot and this fandom has, has been a massive safety net you know like as soon as people have had been making those comments online like they were very quick to to shut it down and and to also one thing i have to say that i i deeply respect is people can also get excited about the the other sense where ex get excited about relationships and sometimes so excited that you want these actors to be together in real life and <laughs> I roll. <laughs> but again our boundaries have been so deeply respected which i haven't had on anything else where people say hey you know that's not fair to put pressure on these people how would you like this you know so I, I think there's just been such a, a mass amount of compassion and empathy. And it, Twitter has really been a safe space for me. And I feel a space of protection. And like these are people are my friends and we really have each other's backs and we look out for each other. And, and you know, we have, uh, we have the, the space to, to play and like poke fun at each other and, and have sarcasm and banter. But at the end of the day, it's a, it's a place where we know we can come and feel understood and feel safe and listened to um, and not feel shut down or rejected or or embarrassed or guilty of, of how we think and how we feel. And we can just kind of be ourselves. And I think there's something that's so pretty about that. And um, so thank you for our whole community creating a safe space and for, for defending us and protecting us because um, we feel the same way about you. and. I'll fight to the death <laughs> to keep this thing going. The, the billboard campaign has like over three thirty five hundred dollars fan funded. <laughs> there, you saw the spree balloon delivery the other day to Hulu. Um, there's uh, all sorts of things fan funded and fan initiatives in the works, and obviously the the social engagement uh, yeah. of it all is just like the power of the switch show. Oh my god, I, I we could not believe it. Me and Ashley were screaming. She I think <laughs> I think when she found it, she like sent it to me or FaceTime me. I think we were at work. I don't know what was going on. And she's like, did you fucking see this? Did you see this? They sent balloons to Hula. And I was like, you guys did it. Please tell me you did it. You did. <laughs> you, you did that. <laughs> so funny though. Oh my god. The the fan engagement. And that's that's the great thing, is like Again, understanding boundary and a sense of humor, like not being so aggressive about the the agenda to keep it going, but just having a sense of humor and doing something like that is harmless, but shows appreciation and love, but it's also comedic and it goes a long way. And, you know, and so just to be that inventive, it's just, it's so innovative and thank you for being respectful about it. As, like as funny as it is, it was still, it was still respectful and it didn't cross any lines. And I think that's, that's where we'd really try our chances is if it kind of went too far or like disrespected somebody or someone's face. And again, like that idea, brilliant, brilliant, because it keeps everybody happy and it's funny. It's awesome. And I mean, again, the billboards, you guys, 
that's insane. Like, please don't spend the money on this stuff. It's so beautiful. Well, like, people are coming together and putting their own time and money into, you know, they love it as much as we do. That's blows my mind. It blows my mind that how lucky I am and that I get to wake up every day and people love to create as much as I do. And it, it, it gives me a job and it gives me a purpose gives me reason to get up every day we can That's be loud hard. we can be annoying but we could be clever yes, <laughs> yes. Clever of the allowing loudness and annoyance be clever <laughs> that. those are all my adjectives can't take that from me <laughs> well just sort of my final question not to keep you too much longer is just something really important that i wanted to ask you is that with the of course um lgbt community representation on screen diminishing more and more um it really says a lot to have a complex morally gray bisexual character be redeemed like we talked about with Scylla, uh to see an unkillable lesbian character in rael and have her affirm her sexuality and not uh, be forced into heteronormity, normative, heteronormativity through hand fasting and yeah. um, have this great meaningful um, loyalty and love affirmation where you're never going to be apart from each other anymore. Mm -hmm. What does it kind of mean to you or uh, what does it really signify as well to you in, in this positive portrayal that stands as really an outlier for the LGBT community, LGBTQ community? I speak to this a lot and not understanding the impact and the gravity that this written relationship has had uh, in terms of representation and understanding and seeing yourself in media. Um, and now that I have a much, much better understanding, I'm still always learning. I'm still always educating myself. Um, it has really lit a fire under my ass uh in my personal missions um and my creative endeavors and um that's as much as i can say because i like i want to talk more about it but it, it does play a part in like the business that i uh am trying so desperately to get to get going um and it's it's changed the lens that i i used to look at the world and the way that i interact with people and um and the stories that i want to tell you know, in, in my acting and, and in any creative endeavor, it's just, it's, it's become massively important to me. I'm very, very passionate about it. Um, and it, I didn't realize how, how many people would reach and how many people that are saying for the first time they feel heard, the first time they feel seen and listened to. And I can't imagine that because it's like, I, you know, I, I previously had spoken to seeing like, for instance, Cinderella on screen where it's like, oh, I was a little, little girl. And like, that was me. I had blonde hair and blue eyes. And I thought I was the shit. I thought I was royalty. I thought I was a princess when I was four years old. <laughs> like, yeah, room bow down. What's up? But like, <laughs> smiley was ending. Sorry. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I've, I've always had that. I've always been catered to. And it, it like it, like would I have grown differently? How how would it have shaped me if I didn't see myself in media? Yet, you know, and it's because it's, it's something that has always been granted to me, and I was I've always been so fortunate. I've never I had oppression or felt discriminated. That it's like it's it's a platform that it's not to be abused, it, and it's it's something that's really it's special to me because I've, because I've been so fortunate and most people haven't been like most people haven't been. Um, so it's, yeah, I mean, like, Oh, there's just like, I could go on and on and on about this cause it's so deep. And I had such a great really, uh, sorry, such a great conversation with, um, S the other day kind of regarding all of this and, and just their, life trajectory and it, it's just it's so it's so interesting once you start meeting people that that want to speak about this because it was of so much newness to me and and like yeah it was so 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 educating to me the last like this show this show has basically completely opened 
my mindscape and I, I think differently, I act differently, I feel differently, so much so I, I question everything. <laughs> um, I question intention, I question motivation and it's, I'm so grateful for it. Um, yeah, but it's a little fire under my ass and I, I intend to, to follow through on mission and the message that I want to hold in my personal life and, and in my storytelling and my platform. It's gravely important to me and um, I know that you always have a friend as, as you guys have always been friends to me, so. Well, I certainly wanna to thank you um, for these beautiful moments and these affirming moments that we've gotten to see portrayed on screen and, and how meaningful and, and deep that they are. And like you said, to talk about the representation, to see that validity, um, that the, it isn't shied away or it isn't um, something that can be easily thrown away through a trope or uh, you know diminished in any capacity. And, and the things that you um, and Amalia do specifically, or maybe even that are unscripted, like the little tender extra touches or like the arm around Scylla's back or the way that Rael looks back on the bus you know to make sure that still is there you know like things that maybe you've added or or we get to see at least that are little affections that may not come up either fully on screen or you know or, or show up but they have that broader meaning they have that great part of the representation that's so important that you you know choose to include or or, or or actively include it's just really beautiful to watch um, between the both of you and and the development development that we've gotten to see for Rayla I really just from from my own heart personally and, and just wanted to say thank you so much to, to you and, and of course to Amalia as well in turn it's, <laughs> it's been <laughs> uh, I and that's why I'm so honest about being it being lost on me when I had first read the scripts because we truly were just enjoying each other's company and um, and the playfulness we had with each other and and what it feels like to create time and space with your person. You know, we weren't realize we were well. I mean, I I didn't realize what the bigger picture meant, and I don't think I could think I could speak for all of us. We didn't know how it would touch people, and and with the intensity that it did, and how much it spread and you know how how much it people felt they got got a voice from this and um yeah it's just it's so surreal to to be a little moving piece in this ever changing ever growing movement and it's yeah there's just there's not enough of it and I, like i've been writing scripts too um which is another thing that i've been keeping busy with and um yeah when i keep referencing my story my storytelling i'm just like i it's important to me. It's important to me. It's important to my personal life. And it's changed the way I see and feel vastly and like understanding queer relationships and and boundaries was, was kind of like the, the pivotal topic of what I was talking about with S and and uh we were just talking about how how it varies and like our understanding of it and um yeah we were just talking about boundaries in general and it's just it's so incredible to see uh, see it reflected in our community and just the respect uh, and compassion there. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. Please keep telling these stories. Please keep sharing your story. Thank you so much for being so open and honest and vulnerable with me and sharing this cry. And I, <laughs> I really, you know, I, I treasure the the emotional connection that that we got to to, to have today together. Too. I'm so brain dead. So thank you for your patience. I've, I, I'm running on very little sleep. I have awful anxiety, and I just was like oh, up until do. dawn, dawn watching New Girl, I'm like clutching my stuffies. <laughs> <laughs> anxiety attacks great um so yeah thank you for for your patience with this it was <laughs> my tedious thought process but my brain just it spins every time i get in in you know the philosophy of this show so it's thank you and thank you for your time and again thank you for being vulnerable with me and sharing with you because it's that's i don't often get that you know like it i've been really fortunate lately with having a like a symbiotic relationship of just being open and feeling like I'm having conversations more with friends rather than interviewers and it's like and it's it's great to when when we're both fans of what we're doing because like we know what you know you, you I've walked into interviews and people thought I've like 
been in movies that I hadn't and like didn't really know what the show was about. And they just kind of asked like the basic questions. And I used to dread interviewing because of that. But like my the relationships I've been making through the interviews I've had lately of just people who are really passionate about what we do. It's just it's it's surreal. It's beautiful. So thank you for taking time and space to be with me and it's been a blessing and thank, thank you again for sharing cry with me and for being open because it's brave and it's hard to do so thank you and it's messy we love yes. messy yes it is but the messy <laughs> Well, I wish you all the best, of course, here with uh, continued season three. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being so gentle and loving with me. And, and I uh, I will hopefully have a chance to talk to you once everything concludes and we can come full circle again, please. We will talk after season three is aired. Oh, we will talk and we will have shit to cry and laugh about and scream about and it'll be great. And I'll see you then. And keep charging for four. We got it. We got this. We're doing this. I, you know what? I feel the optimist even from the production team. Like, they have full faith we're going to keep going. So that is giving me hope. Yay. Thank you. Mwah. You too. Take care, Taylor. Take care. Bye. Be safe. Bye. Thank you.